my face and to turn from your evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Amen. Amen. Those of you that are able to stand, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make the land to my feet, and I will lie right to my path, and I will hide his words in my heart, that I might not sin against God. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again, with life and liberty to all who believe. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's been a good place to be here already. I know things have been a little different, singing along with tracks, and but it's just a blessing to have Brother Barry up here with his, his joy and his love. Oh. The new creation part is something that we just kind of long for. As we were going through Sunday school today, talking about Revelation, sometimes we, we start breaking down in this world, or our bodies, we're aching. Our body, the Bible tells us that one day we're going to put on that incorruptible. And there's going to be a, a time where there's no more sorrow, no more tears, no more body aches, no more troubles of this world. And we just have to suffer it for a little time. But Jesus is the reason for the season. Brother Damien, if you would, would you please pray uh, for the pastor as he brings a message. Please remember Israel. Please remember Haiti. And uh, just all the sorrow that's going on, the uh, gun violence and the mass shootings and just this world as, as we turn back to God. Amen. Well, good morning, Father God. Lord, we ask that you uh, open our ears and our hearts to the message that you've given Pastor Carter to deliver to us today. Lord, allow us to uh, use everything in it that comes through Scripture in our day-to-day -day lives. There are many gems in it we just need to be looking for them. Father God, we ask a blessing on this country. Lord, that it uh, turn away from its evil ways. Turn back to you, Lord. And Lord, it's only going to start through us. If it's not going to start through us, then who? It's us as Christians that need to make our way in this world telling everyone about Jesus. And if every Christian done that, Lord, this, it would turn this nation around. Lord, we also pray for um, Israel. Lord, we just ask for protection around that country, Lord. Your chosen people, Lord, and those that don't know you in Israel, Lord, we just ask that uh, um, they come to find out that you're the one true Lord. Lord, in our lives we find many of those rocks that you will roll out of the way, Lord, as long as we trust you. Amen. Lord, you'll ask us to go through valleys and through fires, Lord, but you're with us. And, Lord, we're only going to come out stronger on the other side. Lord, we thank you for so many blessings that you rain down on us, because we are most unworthy of them. But, Lord, we thank you for those, and we thank you most of all for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins. We pray that you know send me. Amen. Amen. What do you call a knight that won't fight? A knight that won't fight. Sir Render. Uh, sir. <laughs> Brother Mark, give me that. Just <laughs> what do you get when you cross a mad goat and a mad cow together? I guess you could say anger. You get two animals in a bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter gave me that one. So today we're going to talk about David Act 4, The Wayward Track. Just a recap. In the, with uh, Daniel, or David, we had the uh, statement of certainty. When you're in a spiritual warfare, you need the statement of certainty. It is easy to get lost in the cloud of doubt, which creates fear. But if you anchor into a statement of certainty, you will always come out victorious in the battle. Second thing that we knew that you had to have in your spiritual war, thanks to the example of David, is a pure heart. When you're in spiritual warfare, it is never about flesh and bone. It is never about the person that is causing that spiritual warfare. 
It's about the powers and the principalities behind that person. We need to pray for that person because God loves that person as much as he loves us. But we need to take care of business through prayer and faith to get rid of the spiritual warfare behind it. Last week, we talked about managing our blessings. To be successful in spiritual warfare, we need to manage our blessings correctly. We need to understand and not get lost in the sight of being comfortable. That we still serve God. Free time, as you would see it from spiritual warfare, is not free. It is required by God's will. We still need to seek God and what he wants us to do. And this week, we're going to talk about the way we track. And this will end our series on spiritual warfare with, Dan, with David. And then we'll break into our Christmas series for the next four weeks. And then we'll move on into spiritual warfare again. Spiritual warfare never stops. Even when you seem to be on the winning side. Even when the blessings are coming. And the things that were on your plate are off your plate. And the worry is gone. And the stress is gone. Because God once again provided for you. You're still in the spiritual warfare. Chapter 8 shows the victories David was having thanks to God's blessings. You could say he was cruising right along. Question is, is when you are cruising right along, when you're in that state, do you let your guard down? It is easy to do. When you see, foresee no fear, no, no worries, nothing on your plate, your mind's not cluttered with what's going on or what could be or the what ifs of life, and you're cruising along with the blessings that God's giving you, it is very easy for humans to let their guard down, to stop seeking God's will. And when we let our guard down, we take risks. We end up in places that we should not be. We're in situations that we should not be in. Our mind is dwelling on things it should not dwell on. Because we have let our guard down. When you let your guard down, you begin the inner, uh, you enter into the beginning of the wayward track. And that's what we're talking about today. When last we left David, he was on top of his game. Blessings were pouring in. And it seemed that with God's help, he was unstoppable with what he was doing. 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to look at the fall of a pure heart. Now, these first few verses are key, so I really need you to pay attention. Verse 1. In the spring, when kings marched out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. This is a key verse. And it's a key verse because it shows us that David let his guard down. The first part of that verse is that it's in the springtime and kings should be leading his men into battle. But we see here that David sent his general in his stead and he stayed in Jerusalem. When you let your guard down, we end up in places that we shouldn't be in. If God is calling us as we're servants of God to be in one spot, if we're not following God, if we're not on top of that game, if you're not where you're supposed to be according to your master, where are you? You're in a place you shouldn't be. If David would have held to his responsibilities required by God and for a king, he would have been in the field. But David was at home sleeping in his bed in Jerusalem. How many times have you found yourself knowing you should be somewhere 
but you just decided that you didn't want to be there. You know, yeah, there's you know, Wednesday night prayer. We should be there, but I just, you know, I just don't want to do it. I'm lazy. I just don't want to be there. And then one of these times you're going to find if you should have been somewhere that God required you to be, you're going to be where you shouldn't be. And that's where David is. If you're not where God requires you to be, you're in the wrong spot. You're someplace you shouldn't be. David wasn't where he should have been. Which puts him in a place that he shouldn't be. This is the setup. Uh, for what's to come next, the wayward track. He let his guard down. And that's when you get off track. So let's go on to verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around the roof of his palace. Stop there for a minute. David was strolling around his palace, the place where he shouldn't have been. If he was where he should have been, this wouldn't have happened. Let's go on down to the rest of it. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. All right, now, temptation is not a sin. Jesus was tempted. Temptation is the doorway where we can deny it or we can walk through it. David is now at the door of the way we're trapped. He's already in a place he shouldn't be at, and now the door of temptation presents itself to him. The spiritual warfare to him scar his pure heart. But he still hasn't sinned yet. Can I just say this? Human nature has taught me that if you dwell, you fail. Amen. When temptation comes and the opportunity of self arises, you must bring it to light. It must be confessed, brought to light, have someone pray with you, and it needs to be killed immediately. The thought needs to be captured. If that doesn't happen, if you dwell in your faith. I forget who I was talking to a long time ago, and they were mentioning someone, a very godly person, and they were thinking about doing something that was not scriptural. I did not know that person, and I just said, they're going to fall. And that person thought, well, you don't know that person, so how can you make that kind of judgment? It's human nature. The longer you dwell on it, the more sure that you're going to fail. Those thoughts need to be captured and eradicated. So here's David. He was tempted, but he hasn't sinned yet. His heart is still pure. He shouldn't have been where he was because he should have been with these men. I keep saying that because it's very important as we get later on in the sermon. All right, now verse 3. This is where sin begins. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he reported. This is Bathsheba, daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. David sent messengers. To get her. And when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Afterwards, she returned home. The waywardness is in full swing. He is completely off track. His pure heart that was serving God is now scarred and tainted. And when you are serving God with a tainted heart, you will make decisions that are best for you and not for God. You have to remember that the only way that you can serve God is with a pure heart. A pure heart is the only thing that will sacrifice Amen. for their Lord. So now we're going to see a lot of ghosts of Christmas past, if you will, for David. 
see how I brought that right into the season? <laughs> Actions from this point forward, from David, were out of God's will, and they were with a tainted heart. Totally human, from where he see, from where the decisions that he makes. Can I just say this? When you sin, don't believe the excuses that it's okay, it didn't hurt nobody, there was nobody around, this don't bother anybody. That's those are just excuses. Sin has a ripple effect. It's like throwing a stone into a very calm lake or pond, and you see them ripples going out. Well, it doesn't affect anybody but me. It's my walk. I, I'm not hurting anybody. No, you've just tainted your heart. So from this point forward until repentance, your choices and your decisions are not going to be based on what God wants you to do. So every action from that point forward until you purify your heart is going to be a human reaction. There's consequences to our actions. Look at verse 5. The woman conceived and sent word to, uh, to inform David that she, I am pregnant. So now the deceit spreads. David comes up with a plan. He now makes decisions. He made a decision for human self when he had committed adultery. He now makes decisions scheming so that he can cover that sin. So nobody would see it. These are not decisions that glorify God. So we go on and see that the decision that he makes, and we'll get into it, scheming, but he uses, God uses Uriah's good walk to stop the schemes. Sin loves the darkness. God never allows it to stay in darkness. He will always bring sin to light. He does it through our own actions. You know, you can know a believer for a lot of years and you think he's rock solid, but all of a sudden he starts making choices that he don't normally make. He stops doing some of the things that he used to do. Not quoting scripture like he used to quote. His light's a little dim. Those choices that he's been making now make you believe that maybe he's on a wayward track. David goes on. In verses 14 through 25. And he commits murder. He didn't do it by his own hand, but he did it by his choices that he made. And then he took Bathsheba out of his wife. Let's take a look at what scripture says. David sent orders to Job. Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how... Joab and the troops were doing and how the war was going. Then he said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So the Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all his master's servants. He did not go home, did not go down to his house. When it was reported to David that Uriah didn't go home, David questioned Uriah, haven't you just come from a journey? Why did you not go home? Uriah answered to David, the ark Israel and Judea was dwelling in tents, and my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live and by your life, I will not do this. That should have been the attitude of David. He should have been in those tents with his men. He should have been making right choices, but David let down his guard. And here's Uriah teaching the king that I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take pleasures that the rest of the troops can't take. I'm going to stay focused. And I'm going back to battle. Uriah was in his proper place at the proper time. So now, David has to come up with a different plan. 
Stay here today also, David said to Uriah, tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem the day and the next. Then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him. David got him drunk. He went out in the evening to lie down on his cot with his master servants, but he did not go home. David was doing everything, every choice, every decision that he made was now from a tainted heart. There was no glory to God in the choices that he was making, not like it was in the past. Because sin has affected him. When you're in spiritual warfare and you allow your heart to be tainted from that point forward, don't buy into the blindness of false righteousness or buy by the excuses that Satan gives you. You are not right. And the choices that you make, the judgments that you're going to make, need to be questioned by Scripture. You need to get your heart right. You know it. So David goes on. Since Uriah wouldn't go home, the next morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. The letter wrote, put Uriah in the front of the fire. The fire is fighting. Then withdraw from him so that he is struck down and dies. <clears throat> Sin is ugly. Tainted hearts are ugly. Choices that are made were that made to satisfy self and not God. There is no glory in this. But if you remember David, what we had talked about when Saul was chasing David, he was trying to kill him. He tried several times to pin him against the wall. He hunted him like a fugitive. He had a tainted heart, but David's heart was pure. He could have killed Saul, if you remember, in the cave. But he showed Saul that he would never do that. He made a decision from a pure heart. And now, here's David doing the exact same thing that Saul was doing. He had to kill someone to cover his tracks. The only difference is David was successful. And he left Uriah out there and Uriah died. Then David took Bathsheba as his wife. He thought that was the end of that. Now I can get back to what I was doing. I don't have to worry about that no more. There's no more pressure. Nothing good grows from the sinful seeds. Nothing will reflect God's glory when it comes from a tainted heart. We must always remember whom we serve and have a pure heart to do so. Will you stumble and will you fall? Yes. You're not perfect. Neither am I. But you need to recognize that, not buy into the excuses and purify your heart. You need to... Repent from it. Turn away from it. You need to bring it to the light and you need to kill it. And the best way to do that is to never start it. And that's at that temptation door. Where you bring it to light and kill it. My daddy was a smoker for 50 years. Started when he was 10 years old. He looked at me and he said, you know son, don't smoke. The best way to stop smoking is to never start. <laughs> and that's great advice when a sin. The best way to keep your heart pure is to never walk the way we're tracked. Because once you do, you have to fix yourself. Nothing good grows from sinful seeds, as David will soon see. For being a just God, God will pass judgment on the actions of David. Being a just God, God passes actions and judgment against our bad walks. If you are not walking in the light, God uses that two by four therapy I talked to you about. He, he uses life situations to knock you in the head till you fall to your knees. Because you serve Him. You belong to Him. You're supposed to reflect His glory. And then warfare, we get dirty. We do. We've all been there. But with God's grace and mercy, we can purify our heart. All right, look at chapter 12, and we're going to see the judgment that was passed, verses 1 through 15. 
So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had brought. He raised it and grew it, living with him and his children. It shared a, me a meager food and drink from his cup. It slept in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. I got a puppy like that, I'm just saying I can identify. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. This was the story that the Lord wanted to give Nathan to David. Why? It's quite interesting. Because false righteousness blinds us from our walk. We sink our actions into something that is not righteous, but we're calling it righteous. And excuses bind us to this false righteousness. And in doing so, we can't see the actions that we're taking because the excuses tell us that we're allowed to take these things. And the false righteousness stops us from seeing the sin that we're committing. And that's what's happening today. Did you hear the old saying, you couldn't see the forest for the trees? When you're in the middle of this, you can't see the forest for the trees. You can't identify the sin until someone brings your attention to it. I don't know if you've ever had that done, but I've had that done to me. And if you take it the way that it is given, you can snap out of it. So, here's David's reaction. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, this man who deserves to die, because he has done this, thinks uh, and show no pity, he must pay four lambs for his land. Nathan says, You are this man. You remember we talked about Romans chapter 7 verse 20. We talked about Paul saying that when he's committing sin, it, when it comes to that point, it's really not him. It's the sin that's committing these things. You can't see and you can't judge yourself fairly. That's why you've got to have iron sharpens iron. You've got to have someone that's willing to tell you the truth. Samuel Adams says, no, I'm sorry, Thomas Paine, I'm going to confuse you. Thomas Paine says, if you're afraid to offend, then you can't be truthful. One of the jobs as a brother or a sister in Christ is if you see someone on the wayward track, as much as they are near and dear friend to you, you're going to have to go and tell that person. You're going to have to tell them that the actions that you're taking doesn't seem right. And that you'll be praying for them. You're going to have to be the one to refocus them, to get them off that track. Excuses bind us. False righteousness blind us. So much so that God sent Nathan to show David. David says what those actions deserve is death. But we're going to see a little later on, verses 7 and 8. Nathan replied to David, you are the man. This is what the God of Israel said. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judea. And if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. More blessings to come. Why is it always that sin tempts us so much to say what is greener on the other side what you don't have than what you do have? Why can't we be content and grateful for what God has given us? Why do we always look to stretch for more? God says, I've given you, David. I've given you everything. I've delivered you from Saul. I've delivered his house to you and his wife. Later on, we're going to see part of the judgment is that God takes his wives in just a minute. But he goes on to say, I would have given you even more. 
I see it time and time again. Someone in a relationship, in a marriage, may stray to the other side. And the moment that that happens, they regret. They regret everything. They just realize they have destroyed everything that they had built here. Everything that they truly love and cherish and desire that was here is now in jeopardy to go away because they made a bad choice. That's the power of sin and self when it comes to spiritual warfare. Why then have you despised the command of the Lord by doing what I consider evil? This is a wonderful question to ask ourselves. When you're in the middle of your battle of spiritual warfare before you sin, is the decision that you're about to make, does it bring glory to God or disgrace to God? Does it reflect the witness of who Almighty God is or does it destroy your witness? That's the question the Lord will ask us. Why? Why would you do something that I consider evil? I give you everything that you need. I provide for you daily. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife for your own wife. You murdered him with an Ammonite sword. Now therefore... The sword will never leave your house because you despised me and you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. Something that you need to understand. God's forgiveness is complete. When God forgives you, when you repent, God forgives you, it's complete. You're not going to be used by God again. But that stain of your actions past will always follow you. And it's something you have to realize because you're going to have to overcome it to serve your God. Serve your God before that, people took it as knowledge and they took it as faith. Serving your God after you fall is totally different. It's something that you have to learn to overcome. That's what he says, the sword will always be in your house. There's a pastor that built up a great church. This is a fake story. Don't add names to it. There's a pastor that was building up a church. They were doing really great. He had an affair with the deacon's wife. They kicked him out, damaged the church. That's the ripple effect. Damaged the church, he kicked him out. He gets right. And he's a pastor and he gets ready and he purifies his heart. He's being used by God again. He starts a church and it's starting to do good. And they're thinking, well, let's go to that church. Well, you know who pastors that church, don't you? No, who? That's that dude that had an affair with the deacon's wife. Well, I ain't going to that church. That stain stays with you. And instead of getting mad, you're going to have to understand that. You're going to have to admit to it. You're going to have to work harder to serve your God. That's what David's going to have to do as soon as he finishes his discipline. Sin makes us believe God's blessings is not enough. It tells you that there's more for you, for you to grab it, to go for it. It's never enough. How many of you have ever seen the game show with the suitcases, deal or no deal. Anybody seen that show? They come on there with nothing, and they get up there and they get pretty high, but it's never enough. Very rarely do you see someone say, that, that money there is a blessing, I'm stopping. Never enough. When we see the blessings that God's given us in life, when David had all the blessings that God was giving him in his life, it wasn't enough. According to sin. Look at verse 11. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes. And he will sleep with them publicly. 
You acted in secret, but I will do these things before all Israel and in broad daylight. Sin likes the darkness. God will not allow sin to stay in the darkness. You belong to him. You don't call the shots. You are a servant, a bond slave to your Lord Jesus Christ. And if your heart is tainted, he will not allow that to remain tainted because that reflects his glory. You're an instrument to be used by God. And the only way to purify your heart is to bring it to the light. Amen. And then you have to take your lips. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Here we go with the repentance. He's finally realized it. He's been on this wayward track for a long time. He's committed, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He's committed adultery. He has schemed with sin, he finally commits murder, he takes the person's wife. All these decisions that he has been making were making because of self. And now God finally shows him the light and he finally realizes it and he finally admits it and he finally repents from it. This verse is key as you're going to see. Then Nathan replied to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. God's forgiveness is forever, and it is perfect, and you can be used again. The problem of it is, is now the spiritual warfare, they're always going to remind you that you're not worthy to serve your God because of what you did. They're always going to bring someone up to remind you of your actions. Satan's always going to be, bring roadblocks into your ministry after you have sinned. But you need to know it's important. You need to know that God's forgiveness is complete. And it's real. And when you repent, God is going to use you again. So David responded, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. However, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. Then Nathan went on. It is a tough lesson to learn. The disciple of the Lord receives judgment for their sins and will be brought to light and killed. God points out and sin is in secret. And if you are worried that someone will find out that your actions of sin, God already knows it. God takes David's son. We see David turn back to the Lord, hoping God will change his mind. However, God deals in certainties. We talked about that. The statement of certainty. Verse 24. Then David confronted his wife Bathsheba. He went and slept with her. She gave birth to a son named to him Solomon. The Lord loved him. And he sent a message to Nathan the prophet who named him uh, Jedidiah because of the Lord. And we see that he's off the way we're tracking him because of his repentance. God is using him again. You know, King Solomon was the one that built the temple. He was the one to do that. And even though Solomon was conceived in sin because of repentance from David, the sin doesn't transfer, but repentance of David, they had a blessing which was Solomon, and Solomon was used by God. So we can be used again for good. We are not worthless after we have sinned. Spiritual warfare. We're not wasted. We're not done with God says, my forgiveness is real. It's complete. And you will be used again. It's not going to be easy. But you're going to have to work through it. And then it goes on to show the success they had in capturing Reba. So let's review real quickly. The way we're trapped. The way we're trapped starts 
when we are cruising along with the blessings from the last battle that we had served our Lord with. The blessings are coming and we let down our guard. When we let down our guard, we're supposed to be in one spot. God wants us in one spot. We let down our, our responsibilities, God's requirements. And then since we're not where we're supposed to be, we're always where we are. It's easy. Not supposed to be, right? And then all of a sudden you're tempted. Then you have a choice. As your pure heart is being attacked, you have a choice to either enter that door or not enter that door. To bring it to light and kill it, to capture your thoughts, or to dwell. And if you dwell, you fail. fail. Love the enthusiasm. Then we listen to self and we start making decisions because our heart is not tainted and those decisions are what's best for us and what we think is what's best for us. None of it reflects the glory of God. Our choices that we make just dig ourselves deeper and deeper down this way we're trapped. Then we buy into the false righteousness and the excuses of why we're doing what we're doing. And then all of a sudden God brings it to light. You get caught if you will. God brings it to light because you're his and you shouldn't be there. You need to be where he wants you to be. And because it's brought to light, then it needs to be judgment. And after judgment, there is repentance from you. And after repentance, there is forgiveness by God. And when there's forgiveness by God, there's service for God. We are all worthy to serve, not because of our actions, but because of God's grace, because of God's mercy, because of God's unconditional love. So, after the way we're tracked, you need to know, no matter how many times Satan points the finger at you and tells you you're not worthy, you can serve after a fall. You can. You can serve after a fall. We are all usable after his faithfulness and grace. Amen. Bow your heads with me, if you will. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or if you're watching by video, you can change all that. If the Holy Spirit is in your, is calling you to fill that hole that you have, all you have to do is say this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, but you do have to mean it. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I'm lost and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours and I will follow you for an eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed. If you said that prayer here today, I just want you to raise your head and raise your hand. I'm going to ask you three questions. Alright, if you said that prayer through the video ministry, welcome to the family of God. We invite you to come to Shine Light Baptist Church. The address is on the screen. Tell us about that choice that you made so that we can start you on your path of discipleship. If you have a home church or your family has a church that you're comfortable with, then we encourage you to go to that pastor and tell them about your choice so that they can start you on your path of discipleship. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Maybe you find yourself at in this situation. Maybe God is using this sermon as a light for you that maybe you're on the way to track. I don't know. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It's His job to let us know these things. And if that's the case, don't buy into the excuses and don't be blinded by the false righteousness. You can't serve God. You have to repent. Own up to it. Repent from where you're at and allow God to forgive you completely to purify your tainted heart so that you can serve him once again. To my right, your left, there is a place at the altar for take care of these things. One on one with the Lord. To my left, your right, you can come down. We have prayer warriors and counselors standing by to pray with you. If you so choose so. If you want one on one counseling or prayer, our prayer room is open in the front. Brother Richard is back there uh, and he will pray with you and help you the best that he can. 
And if you can't get the information you want, you'll go with someone that can. Our job here at Shining Light is to make you walk stronger when you leave than when you can. Know that God loves you and so do we. You may raise your hand, stand with us, Brother Barry, you lead us in the invitation. You have the ability to stand with us,